good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for all coming early. I usually expect most of my studio, student audiences in the last three or four minutes to come in, so it's good to see you all got here on time. I'm Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, which sponsors programming on campus on uh, meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. Uh, one of the great things we get to do is uh, coordinate the Kraft Hyatt Program for Jewish Christian Understanding uh, with a group of faculty who teach in that area. Through the Kraft Hyatt Fund, we've been able to uh, enrich teaching and learning at Holy Cross on the Holocaust, Jewish life, and Jewish-Christian relations. The programs enable us to send faculty and students to uh, study the Holocaust at Yad Vashem, uh, to send students to the Rothberg International School in uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem. If some of you are interested, that's always a possibility for summer study, funded even. Um, and uh, to bring visiting scholars and distinguished speakers on Jewish-Christian relations, which is what we get to do today. You can learn more about that programming. It's online at uh, holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. We're deeply grateful to the late uh, Jacob and Francis Hyatt of Worcester and to Robert Kraft and his late wife, Myra Hyatt Kraft, who really made all of this possible over the years. Today I'm really pleased to welcome Adele Reinhartz for a talk uh, whose title delighted me initially in its directness, Jesus, Good Jew or Bad Jew. When she first broached that title, I said, that, that's the title we want. Uh, professor Reinhardt is professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa. In this year, she's Corcoran Visiting Chair in Jewish-Christian Relations at Boston College. Her research areas include New Testament, Early just Jewish-Christian Relations, the Bible and Film, and Feminist Biblical Criticism. She's the author of many books, including The Bible and Cinema, An Introduction in 2013, Caiaphas the High Priest in 2011, Jesus of Hollywood in 2007, and Befriending the Beloved Disciple, a Jewish reading of the Gospel of John, which she wrote in 2003, which was a finalist for a National Jewish Book Award and a winner of the F.W. Beer Award for Outstanding Book on Christian Origins. In 2000, she won the Canadian Jewish Book Award for biblical scholarship for her publication, Why Ask My Name? Question mark, Anonymity and Identity in Biblical Narrative. Professor Reinhardt is general editor of the Journal of Biblical Literature and was elected to the Royal Society of Canada in 2005. So I can't wait to hear how, how she approaches <laughs> this topic. And please join me in welcoming Michelle sure. Reinhardt. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. This is my first visit to, uh, to Holy Cross, and um, I suppose it being Ash Wednesday, it's uh, fortuitous or a good occasion to come and talk about whether Jesus was a bad Jew or a good Jew. Josh, Josh Harmon's 2012 comedy called Bad Jews portrays the conflict between two cousins, Daphna and Liam, the night after their grandfather's funeral. Each of them claims the small gold chain, <laughs> the small gold chain pictured here, uh, which is a chai uh, as their rightful inheritance. This chai is not particularly valuable, but it carries immense emotional weight as a symbol of their grandfather's survival during the Holocaust, his love for his family, and most important, for Jewish continuity. For Daphna, by far the more vocal of the two cousins, the matter comes down to which one of them is the better Jew. To underscore her cousin's colossal failure as a Jew, Daphna recalls a Passover Seder to which Liam had brought his Japanese girlfriend, Miyushi. After the Seder, she says, our parents had all gone to bed. We were watching TV, and Liam was like, I'm hungry even though he had just had this enormous meal. And he went into the kitchen and found these shortbread cookies, and even Miyushi was like, I thought you weren't supposed to eat that on Passover. But Liam just smiled, popped a cookie in his mouth, and was like, I'm a bad Jew. <laughs> then he turned to me, even though he knew I was keeping Passover, handed me the bag and goes, want one? I'm a bad Jew, she repeats, mocking her cousin. In this diatribe, Daphna judges her cousin to be a bad Jew on account of his failure to live according to certain aspects of Jewish law, in other words, her own understanding of what it means to live a Jewish life. This bad Jew, good Jew judgment is, for better or for worse, a feature of Jewish communal life, 
which is why Josh Harmon could mock it so effectively in his play. Another playful use of this judgment can be seen in this ad. Uh, this is for bad Jew kosher barbecue sauce. Here the bad Jew reference is ironic rather than outraged. Because bad Jew barbecue sauce is kosher, it allows Jews to feel bad without actually being bad. Now to be sure, not all references to good Jews or bad Jews refer to observance. A recent column in the Jerusalem Post, for example, defined a good Jew on the basis of values, humility, justice, truth, modesty, scholarship, and faith. And a 2014 TED Talk called What Makes a Good Jew boiled it all down to being good to one's mother. I like that one. But for the most part in our day, to label someone a good Jew means passing judgment on their level of Jewish observance. We might think that this good Jew, bad Jew judgment pertains only, well, to the modern, uh, <laughs> only to the modern period in which religious observance can be separated from Jewish identity. But perhaps the most frequently judged Jew in this regard is not a modern Jew, but an ancient Jew, Jesus of Nazareth. And here he is, good Jew. This afternoon, we will explore Jesus' Jewishness, specifically his observance of Jewish law and practice from the perspective of the good Jew, bad Jew dichotomy. To begin with, we'll look briefly at the Gospels, our only direct sources for the historical Jesus. Second, we will glance at some of the ways in which Jesus' Jewishness has been construed in modern scholarship. We will then move to a more detailed look at two ancient portraits of Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John. And finally, we'll reflect on the implications of Jesus' Jewishness for history, scholarship, and Jewish-Christian relations in our own day. Now, let me say categorically, Jesus was a Jew. This fact continues to surprise some and to be denied by others, as in this uh, photo. <laughs> but, or let me not photo, but drawing. But from a historical perspective, it is, it is as firm as any fact can be when it comes to the historical Jesus. All four New Testament Gospels agree that Jesus grew up in the Galilee and spent time in Jerusalem during the first third of the first century, including the years between 18 and 26, when Pontius Pilate was the representative of Rome and Caiaphas was the high priest. And all four agree that Jesus interacted primarily with other Jews. According to Matthew, Jesus was concerned only about his fellow Jews, as we see in this passage. Uh, Jesus initially refused to heal the child of a Canaanite woman on the grounds that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Gospel of Luke emphasizes that Jesus' parents adhere to Jewish law. According to Luke 2.21, he was circumcised on the eighth day. And furthermore, when the time came uh, for purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to the temple to present him to the Lord as it is written, uh, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice. Jesus' parents also made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover along with Jesus and perhaps celebrated Jesus' bar mitzvah or the ancient equivalent at the temple just as many Jews today celebrate theirs at the Western Wall. The Gospel of John too suggests that Jesus was aware of and generally adhered to Jewish law and practice. In John 2, this is the wedding at Cana, uh, there's a reference to the ritual, uh, the stone jars that are there for ritual hand washing, which was done prior to the meal. In John 6, 11, Jesus gives thanks for uh, bread, the bread that he's going to divide among the multitudes. And this seems to be the traditional Jewish blessing of bread that uh, takes place before eating um, a proper meal. And Jesus goes up to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage festivals of Passover and Tabernacles, Sukkot, 
and he is present in the temple also for Hanukkah, the feast of the dedication. Whether Jesus was a rabbi, or whether the term rabbi already denoted a leader of the Jewish community in the first century is unknown. But according to the Gospel of Mark, Peter called Jesus rabbi. Uh, as we see here, rabbi, uh, it is good for us here, let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then we see also in um, 1121, uh, that Peter calls Jesus rabbi when he's commenting on the withered fig tree. According to Matthew, Judas also called Jesus rabbi during the Last Supper, and then again uh, during the moment of betrayal. And uh, the Gospel of John also mentions that several disciples addressed Jesus in this way, including, including Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb. She calls him Rabuni, and the narrator explains that this refers, uh, that this means teacher uh, in Hebrew, although it's, not, it's more Aramaic than Hebrew. So the ancient evidence that we have, which is entirely from the Gospels, uh, is very clear in terms of Jesus' Jewish identity, and also clear that he participated in Jewish practice and in Jewish communal life, probably in the same way that everybody else did. Now, in the face of this overwhelming evidence, it should be difficult to deny that Jesus was a good Jew. And yet, there are scholars who have ignored, suppressed, or reinterpreted the gospel evidence of his religious observance. For some 19th and 20th century scholars, this discomfort was highly colored by anti-Semitism. And here we have, for example, uh, Julius Wellhausen, one of the architects of modern biblical scholarship, who is a mild but important example of this perspective. In his 1905 address, uh, uh, sorry, 1905 introduction to the Synoptic Gospels, Wellhausen acknowledged that Jesus was not a Christian, but a Jew. He did not proclaim a new faith, but he taught to do the will of God. For him as well, as for Jews generally, the will of God was contained in the law and in the other holy scriptures counted as part of them. Yet, Wellhausen continues, he showed another way to fulfill the will of God than the one the pious Jews, in accordance with the instructions given them by their authoritative teachers, regarded as the right one and painstakingly followed. So the key term here is the word painstakingly which points to the widespread view among early 20th century theologians that Judaism was an empty, legalistic religion dedicated only to the meticulous observance of minute legal details, a religion that had lost its vitality and its viability with the coming of Christ two millennia earlier. Far more explicit than Wellhausen was an earlier scholar, <clears throat> the 19th century French theologian, uh, Ernest Renan, who wrote a book called uh, Vie de Jésus. Ren Renan could not entirely write Jewishness out of Ju Jesus' identity and life story, but he argued vigorously that by the time Jesus began his ministry, there was no union possible between him and the ancient Jewish religion. The abrogation of the sacrifices which had caused Jesus so much disgust, the suppression of an impious and haughty priesthood, and in a general sense, the abrogation of the law appeared to Jesus as absolute necessity. From this time, he appears no more as a Jewish reformer, but as a destroyer of Judaism. In other words, Jesus was no longer a Jew. He proclaimed the rights of man, not the rights of the Jew, the deliverance of man, not the deliverance of the Jews. Now these authors did not question Jesus' Jewish birth, but they did question his ongoing Jewish identity. In their eyes, Jesus abandoned and abrogated Jewish law. He became a bad Jew, from a Jewish perspective, as an essential step in forwarding God's plan for universal salvation. And underlying this, of course, is the idea that Jewish law is what is bad, not Jesus. 
In the Nazi era, in the first half of the 20th century, some scholars went even further to deny Jesus' Jewishness altogether. There was a, the Nazis had set up an institute for the study and eradication of Jewish influence on German religious life. This was led by a highly regarded theologian named Walter Grundemann, um, who was still an influence at the time that I went to graduate school in the, uh, in the 70s, so some decades after the end of the war. The role of this institute, the mandate, was to demonstrate that Jesus was not a Jew, but an Aryan, on the grounds that in the first century, the Galilee was populated primarily by Gentiles rather than Jews. Let me just see. Yeah, and so the definitive study of that institute um, is this uh, truly compelling book by Susanna Heschel called The Aryan Jesus, Christian Theologians and the Bible in Nazi Germany. I'm pleased to report, however, that such views are no longer mainstream in current scholarship. In the past several decades, historians and theologians alike have acknowledged and repudiated the anti-Semitism inherent in the views of Wellhausen, Renan, and Grundemann. To be sure, some recent scholars do perceive Jesus as rejecting some, if not all, of Torah observance, in particular the purity laws. The majority, however, situate Jesus firmly within early first century Judaism. John Meyer, for example, has written volumes, literally, I think volume five of seven has just come out, uh, based on the premise that Jesus was deeply engaged with the same issues of law and observance that preoccupied other first century Jews. In Meyer's words, the historical Jesus is the halachic Jesus, that is the Jesus concerned with and arguing about the Mosaic law and the questions of practice arising from it. Others, such as uh, Ed Sanders, who was my own uh, thesis supervisor, uh, Amy Jill Levine, another Jewish New Testament scholar, uh, would agree with Meyer's assessment. Of course, attempts to reconstruct the historical Jesus, or for that matter, any other ancient figure, movement, or phenomenon, are shaped not only by the available primary sources, but also by the social context and climate in which historians and theologians are themselves working. It is not surprising that Grundemann and others argued for an Aryan Jesus, given that the Institute for the Study and Eradication of Jewish Influence on German Religious Life was an integral part of the Nazi anti-Semitic propaganda machine. Neither should it surprise us that post-Holocaust scholarship has, for the most part, taken the opposite approach. The affirmation of a Jewish Jesus reflects the efforts by both Jews and Christians to put the history of Christian anti-Semitism behind them. But as I hope to show, it is not only modern scholars whose theories are shaped by their historical and social contexts and their larger aims or goals. The same thing is true of the evangelists. Although the New Testament Gospels are our main sources for the life and teachings of the historical Jesus, they too reflect the times in which they were written, uh, several decades, in most cases five or six decades, after the time of Jesus himself. And they too differ on the question of whether Jesus was a good Jew or a bad Jew. To illustrate this point, we'll now compare briefly the Gospels of Matthew and John, both stemming from the late first century, some six decades after Jesus' death, and at least a generation after the destruction of Herod's temple, um, during, uh, sorry, after the destruction of Herod's temple during the first Jewish revolt against Rome. A, a few points before we begin. First, as is the case with any New Testament text or topic, <coughs> there are multiple and often conflicting scholarly opinions on just about everything to do with this issue. What I will give you is my own considered opinion, which is often, but not always, shared by other scholars. Second, I should point out that the actual authors of the Gospels are unknown. We call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but this is a matter of convention and convenience rather than historical accuracy. <coughs> 
third, my main point, and this is important in the rest of this talk, does not concern the historical and Jewishly observant Jesus as such, but how these two gospels position themselves vis-a-vis -vis Jewish, sorry, position Jesus vis-a-vis -vis Jewish law and practice. Although these gospels are in a sense biographies, their stories of Jesus are shaped by their author's circumstances, goals, aspirations, and opinions. It is notoriously difficult to pick out the historical facts about Jesus from the complex and heavily theological gospels as we have them in the New Testament. And thankfully, it is not my task to do so today beyond what I've already suggested in terms of his Jewish identity. My only goal is to show that these two gospels, like modern scholarship, attempt to situate Jesus Jewishly in ways that reflect their own concerns as much or more than their knowledge of Jesus himself. Okay, so we turn to Matthew. One of the most enigmatic statements in the Gospel of Matthew is found in chapter 5, verse 17, in which Jesus declares, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. This passage seems simply to declare the ongoing eternal validity of the Jewish scriptures as God's revelation. And many commentators do read it that way. In fact, though, its meaning hinges on the ambiguity of the verb translated as to fulfill at the end of this verse. Now, there are many laws which we must fulfill. That is, laws to which we are subject our entire lives. Uh, for example, uh, traffic laws and uh, tax laws. On the other hand, we also use the term fulfill in a way that implies an endpoint. For example, students studying here at Holy Cross uh, for their bachelor degrees must fulfill a number of requirements in order to receive their degrees. But once they have fulfilled those requirements, they are no longer subject to them. So in Matthew 5.17, is Jesus declaring that the law is eternally valid? Or is he declaring that he has put in motion a process that will fulfill its requirements once and for all? This latter interpretation would seem to be supported by verse uh, 18, which suggests that the law remains in place until a particular point in time when all has been accomplished. Nevertheless, I believe that Matthew did not see Jesus as abrogating, abrogating the Torah or Jewish law. In Matthew 22, a Pharisee questions Jesus about the commandments. And he asks, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So Jesus responds to the Pharisees' question by citing two commandments taken directly from the Torah. The first is the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, or the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The second is from Leviticus 19. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The same saying from Leviticus is paraphrased in Matthew 7, 12. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. This emphasis that Matthew's Jesus places on the so-called golden rule calls to mind an anecdote in the Babylonian Talmud in tractate uh, Shabbat. What happened here? There we go. Uh, it happened that a certain heathen, a pagan, came before Shammai and said to him, make me a proselyte, a convert, on condition that you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. So Shammai chased him out, uh, and uh, then the pagan went before Hillel, another Pharisee, uh, and Hillel said to him, what is hateful to you, do not to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. 
The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. The similarity of the 6th century rabbinic text to the 1st century Matthaean text suggests that such oh. stories were present in Jewish circles for centuries before the Talmud was written down, and that they were associated with a range of ancient teachers. In any case, the parallel contributes to the depiction of Matthew's Jesus as a Jewish teacher fully entrenched in his tradition. Furthermore, Matthew's Jesus counsels others to keep various aspects of the law. After healing a leper, for example, he advised him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. This reflects Leviticus 14, in which God provides detailed instructions for the cleansed leper who must come to the priest and make sacrifices. Like other writers of the period, Matthew emphasized the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Um, commandments numbers six, seven, eight, nine, followed by five on the Golden Rule, are all mentioned in Jesus' encounter with the man who asked, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So thus far, there is little to distinguish Matthew's Jesus from any ancient Jewish or even Pharisaic teacher. This straightforward image is complicated, however, by other elements in Matthew's Gospel. The Gospel contains several passages in which the Pharisees or other Jewish leaders accuse Jesus of transgressing the law. In Matthew 12, the Pharisees called Jesus uh, on the disciples' violation of Sabbath law. Matthew describes a situation in which Jesus and his disciples were walking through grain fields on the Sabbath. The disciples were hungry and plucked grain to eat. And the Pharisees said, look, Jesus, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And then Jesus said to them, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? Um, here we have a, a kind of a convoluted story. He entered the house of God, ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In this passage, Jesus defends his disciples by drawing on two precedents from the Hebrew Bible. One is an incident in which David and his companions entered the temple and ate the bread of the presence to which they were not entitled. That's in 1 Samuel 21. The second concerns the fact that priests regularly conducted sacrifices on the Sabbath, despite the fact that according to biblical law, slaughtering an animal is not permitted on the Sabbath. Jesus' entire speech fails to address the Pharisees' point. While he offers a defense based on precedent, the main point is contained in the last verse, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not an absolute law that supersedes everything else. Rather, it can be overruled by the Son of Man. And although the story doesn't say so, we know from reading uh, the Gospel as a whole that the Son of Man is Jesus himself. Immediately after this incident, there is another one that also concerns the Sabbath. And this is um, uh, uh, on the screen right here. After entering a synagogue, the Pharisees attempt to entrap Jesus by asking, is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? And then Jesus responds with a rhetorical question of his own. Suppose one of you has only one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? And so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus then heals the man with the withered hand, 
thereby only increasing the tension. Now, in this response to the Pharisees, Jesus makes use of what we call an a fortiori argument, or in Hebrew, kal b'chomer. He argues from a minor situation, a sheep falling into a pit, to a major situation, the well-being of a person. This response does not challenge the importance or sanctity of the Sabbath, but it does imply, again, that observing the Sabbath is not an absolute requirement. Um, the Sabbath restrictions um, are subject to the health and welfare of others. Next, in Matthew 15, the Pharisees and scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples break the tradition of the, of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. This is not a cleanliness question uh, having to do with what we all tell our children or what you've been told uh, your whole lives about you know, germs and so on. Um, but it's a ritual question. And Jesus answers with the question, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and your mother, and God said, whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had for me is given to God, then that person need not honor the father. And so in this way you make void the word of God. Okay, this is a very complicated set of laws having to do with uh, the pledging of money and the making of vows and so on. But what Jesus is doing here is accusing the Pharisees of hypocrisy, a theme that becomes more and more prominent as Matthew's story proceeds. Matthew's Jesus here seems to be alluding to a legal discussion whose contours are difficult to discern with the sources at our disposal. But for our purposes, the important point is the implicit accusation, again, of hypocrisy. If the Pharisees accuse him of breaking with tradition by not engaging in ritual hand washing before a meal, Jesus, in turn, accuses them of doing the same by allowing those who vow to make a gift to God to violate the fundamental commandment to honor their parents, probably by supporting them financially um, as they age. Finally, there is the matter of fasting. In Matthew 9, 14, a disciple of John the Baptist approaches Jesus to ask about fasting. Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't? And again, Jesus responds with an analogy. The wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Here Jesus acknowledges that they don't fast, and he explains that fasting is for a time of mourning which will come in the future but is not yet upon them. The continuation of his response goes further towards the idea that the law is abrogated than the other examples we have just considered. So it goes much further in the direction of, of uh, Jesus canceling certain aspects of the law. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins, otherwise the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. Jesus is the new cloth and the new wine that cannot be patched onto the old cloak or poured into old wineskins of Torah or of traditional observances such as fasting. For Matthew, however, and I think uh, for the uh, other Gospels as well, for Matthew's Jews, Jesus' most egregious offense is blasphemy. This accusation comes up in Matthew 9, 2, when Jesus tells the paralytic, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven but it plays a major role in Matthew's version of Jesus' trial before the high priest. A trial that Matthew portrays as an essential link in the chain of events leading to the crucifixion. According to Matthew, the chief priests and council were trying hard to find false testimony against Jesus. Finally, it was Jesus who provided them with the needed evidence. So Matthew 26, the high priest stands up and says, have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? 
And then he asks, he says again, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has blasphemed, why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy, what is your verdict? And the council answered, he deserves death. So this range of stories calls into question the image of the good Torah-observant Jesus that appears elsewhere in Matthew. Adding yet another puzzling layer to this picture are the antitheses which occupy a lengthy section of chapter five. There are six of these antitheses, and here's the first one just to illustrate. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. All six antitheses have the same fundamental structure. The first statement cites a law from the Torah, and the second reinterprets it, in all cases intensifying or extending its meaning beyond the specific action described. In this way, the law against murder is extended to anger or insults. The law against committing adultery is extended to thinking lustful thoughts about a married woman. And the law against swearing falsely is extended to all vows. The lex talionis, an eye for an eye, is turned into its opposite, turn the other cheek. And the requirement to love your friend is turned into an injunction to love your enemy. Perhaps then, the antitheses amount to an abrogation of at least some of the laws. But there is one antithesis that casts doubt on this conclusion, and that is the one that concerns divorce. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Biblical law has very little to say about divorce. We have Matthew 20, I mean Deuteronomy 24, which indicates that a man can divorce a woman simply because he finds something objectionable about her, and so he writes her a certificate of divorce. But otherwise, the Torah does not elaborate on what was perhaps a well-known practice in biblical times. The Bible's silence about divorce was filled in by later interpreters who needed, in order to make this work at all in, uh, in everyday life, needed to determine the circumstances under which divorce was permissible and the mechanisms for doing so. This is the subject of a passage in the third century codification of Jewish law, the Mishnah. The house of Shammai say, a man should not divorce his wife unless he has found her guilty of some unseemly conduct. As it says, because he has found some unseemly thing in her. The house of Hillel, however, say that he may divorce her even if she has merely spoiled his soup. Uh, and most interpreters, I think, would say it doesn't really mean literally about spoiling the soup. It means what would lead a wife to spoil her husband's soup? Clearly an irrevocable uh, breakdown in relationship. The views that Matthew ascribes, just being a bad cook, I don't know. The views that Matthew ascribes to Jesus correspond well to those that the Mishnah ascribes to the house of Shammai. In the case of divorce, therefore, the antithesis does not negate the law, but describes the condition under which it applies. The antithetical formula, characterized by the word but, implies that Jesus is negating a biblical law but the content does not bear out that conclusion, particularly in light of the rabbinic parallel. So by and large, Matthew's Jesus conforms to the good Jew stereotype. Jesus upholds the law as an eternally valid expression of the divine will, and despite the Pharisees' criticisms, he generally abides by Jewish law and practice. 
Arguments with the Pharisees almost always concern the interpretation of Jewish law, particularly when there is a conflict between two important principles, the sanctity of human life and the observance of the Sabbath, or the law on vows and the law on honoring one's parents. Most consequential is the charge of blasphemy on the basis of which Jesus is condemned by the high priest and council. The charge of blasphemy implies a breach of monotheism prompted in the trial scene, as we've seen, by Jesus' statement that from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. The context clarifies that from Matthew's perspective, this is a trumped up charge. Jesus' status as the Son of Man is sanctioned by God and therefore not a breach of monotheism at all. But its place in the narrative as the point of no return on the road to crucifixion testifies to its importance. For John, as we shall now see, such Christological claims, and particularly the claim of special relationship to God, have a profound impact on the image of the Jewish Jesus that emerges. So now we'll take a look at the Gospel of John, more briefly than our look at Matthew. As we saw at the outset, John's Gospel, like Matthew's, portrays the Jewish Jesus who travels to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage festivals, blesses the bread before sharing with others, and in other ways leads a recognizably Jewish way of life. Nevertheless, it is striking in a gospel that contains 70 occurrences of the terms Jew or Jews that Jesus is called a Jew only once, and that is by the Samaritan woman. Uh, who says to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And then the narrator explains that Jews don't share things in common with Samaritans. The gospel here suggests that Jesus was seen by others as a Jew, and equally important for this passage, that by asking the woman for a drink, Jesus was crossing a social boundary, behaving in a way that a good first century Jew should not. Further into his conversation with the Samaritan woman, John's Jesus prophesies a time when one set of commandments, those pertaining to pilgrimage, will no longer be observed. Uh, he says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, the holy mountain of the Samaritans, nor in Jerusalem. This prophecy is partially fulfilled within the gospel itself. When Jesus stays in the Galilee, this is chapter 6, for the Passover, and feeds bread and fish to thousands of others who, like him, have not gone up to Jerusalem for uh, that particular pilgrimage festival. Nevertheless, Jesus returns to Jerusalem for subsequent pilgrimage festivals, such as Tabernacles in chapter 7 and another Passover in chapter 12. This ambivalent portrait of Jesus is fleshed out by other passages. First, whereas Matthew's Jesus consistently speaks of the law, John's Jesus refers to your law. In 817, he tells the Jews that in your law, it is written that testimony of two witnesses is valid. And in 1034, as we see here, he asks, is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? This usage distances Jesus from the Torah, despite the fact that he himself observes at least some aspects of Torah law. Second, John's Gospel does not have Jesus engage at length with questions of Jewish law and practice, with one exception, the Sabbath. Like his Matthean counterpart, John's, uh, Jesus is criticized for healing on the Sabbath. In John 5, uh, after Jesus heals a disabled man, the Jews criticize both Jesus for healing and the healed man for carrying his mat on, mat on the Sabbath. Uh, in John 9, after Jesus restores the sight of a man born blind, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Jesus explains his stance in various ways. Um, in John 7, he employs an a fortiori argument, as we saw in Matthew as well. He says, I performed one work and all of you were astonished. 
Moses gave you circumcision, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath in order that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I healed a man's whole body on the Sabbath? In other words, if the Torah permits or even mandates the removal of a body part on the Sabbath, should it not stand to reason that restoring a person's full health should also be permitted? More fundamental, however, is his declaration in 517. My father is still working, and I also am working. That's his reason for healing the disabled man on the Sabbath. The narrator explains that for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. Here, John's Jesus asserts his sovereignty over the Sabbath, much like Jesus does in Matthew. But whereas Matthew has Jesus phrased this assertion in a roundabout way, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, John's Jesus is much more direct. My Father is working, and I'm working. John has Jesus justify his Sabbath breach on the grounds of his filial relationship to God, his identity as God's Son. Just as God is exempt from Sabbath observance, after all, babies are born and plants grow and rain happens uh, on the Sabbath as they do on other days, so too is his son exempt. In other words, the fundamental issue in John is not observance, but Christology. This emerges most clearly in the astounding statement in 1030, the Father and I are one. Finally, like Matthew, John emphasizes the accusation of blasphemy. Is not Jesus violating the fundamental tenet of monotheism by claiming to be the Son of God and even equal to God? In response, John's Jesus, like a good Jew, invokes scripture and affirms the eternal viability of law. Jesus says, is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? If those to whom the word of God came were called gods, and the scripture cannot be annulled, can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said I am God's son? If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Indeed, it is the works, such as Jesus' ability to heal the sick and raise the dead, that demonstrate the father-son relationship. The most explicit evidence occurs in two passages in which Jesus calls directly on God for validation. In John 11, Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. Jesus approaches the grave and asks that the stone be rolled away. So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. And then he cried out, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out and um, was unwrapped uh, and apparently continued on uh, with his life. The second occurs in John 12, the final moments of Jesus' ministry. When Jesus admits, now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. So for the Gospel of John, Christology overrides everything else. While John portrays Jesus as someone who generally lives his life according to the Jewish calendar, he contradicts that image at points where it serves his Christological purpose. The Gospel of John presents Jesus as a good Jew only to the extent that Jewish observance does not interfere with his Christological identity. The result is a portrait of Jesus that is highly ambiguous and also ambivalent about Jesus' Jewish identity. Is he a good Jew or even a Jew at all? The portrayal of Jesus in both Matthew and John 
reflects a tension inherent in early Christian theology. How to reconcile Jesus' Jewish identity, which places him as one individual among many others, with his Christological identity, which identifies him as the unique Messiah, the Son of God. Each evangelist attempts to resolve this tension in ways that make sense to him, and I would suggest that further the goals of the gospel attributed to him. As with just about every New Testament question, we cannot know the aims and audiences of the gospels with any precision. But I accept the current scholarly consensus that Matthew's gospel was probably written in the 80s of the first century, perhaps in Antioch, and that it was addressed to a Jewish Christian community that had incorporated faith in Jesus as the Messiah into Jewish observance. A Jewish Jesus who nevertheless asserts his authoritative interpretation, grounded in his messianic identity, may have appealed to those who themselves continued both to engage in Jewish practice and affirm their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. The Gospel of John, on the other hand, probably had a very different audience in mind. Like Matthew, John was probably written in the late first century in the Roman diaspora, perhaps in Ephesus. Although many scholars insist that John too was written for a Jewish Christian audience, I believe that many elements within this gospel, including its portrait of Jesus, imply a Gentile audience, either in whole or in part. Unlike Matthew, John has a powerful focus on Jesus' identity as God's son, and he insists relentlessly that the only path to a relationship with God is to have faith in his son. And in doing so, the Gospel of John sharpens the conflict between Jesus and the Jews. Throughout the Gospel, Jesus criticizes and condemns the Jews who don't believe in him. The passages in which Jesus refers to the Torah as your law and prophesies an end to the centrality of Mount Zion are in keeping with the overall conflictual tenor of Jesus' encounters with the Jews. It is hard to imagine that this portrayal would have appealed to an audience that still identified in some way with Jewish practice. The good Jew, bad Jew question is relevant not only for historians and New Testament interpreters, but also for contemporary Jewish Christian understanding. Just as Renan, Wellhausen, Grundemann, and others constructed Jesus' Jewish identity in ways that cohered with their own anti-Judaism, so too does the current focus on the Jewish Jesus, while historically more honest, also cohere with social trends towards rapprochement between Jews and Christians in the post-Holocaust period. Evidence of such a trend can be seen in various declarations, particularly in the Catholic context, such as Nostra Aetate, and uh, this document called The Gifts and the Calling of God, which was issued uh, in December. It can also be seen in the flourishing of centers and programs in Jewish Christian dialogue, and the movement to replace the traditional motifs of synagogue and church, in which the synagogue is blindfolded and downtrodden, with a motif conveying mutual respect and understanding. And this is an image of a sculpture that was um, unveiled uh, by Pope Francis in his recent visit to the United States. I applaud this trend in scholarship and in Jewish Christian dialogue. The idea that Jesus was a good Jew helps Christians overcome the age old dichotomy between Christians and Jews that is apparent even in first century texts such as the Gospel of John. And it encourages Christians to have sympathy for and a desire to learn about Judaism. Similarly, Relinquishing the notion that Jesus was a bad Jew provides today's Jews with a positive framework within which to situate Jesus and to see him as someone who, like other Jewish teachers, found a way of interpreting the Torah that was meaningful to many. Nevertheless, the tension between Jesus' Jewishness and Christian theology and between Jews and Christians cannot be erased simply by acknowledging that Jesus was a Jew. Whether Jesus was a good Jew or a bad Jew, according to our own criteria or those of others, 
I believe that our task in a pluralistic society is not so much to deny our differences or to blend our identities, as this image might suggest. Rather, it is a matter of talking to the other, learning in the presence of the other, agreeing to disagree, and most important, truly hearing one another's stories. Of course, Josh Harmon's play, Bad Jews, would have lost much of its humor had the cousins Liam and Daphna listened to each other's stories and gotten over the judgmental good Jew, bad Jew dichotomy. In real life, however, overcoming such differences is well worth a try, whether about the life and significance of Jesus, the interpretation of the Gospels, the grim history of Jewish-Christian relations, or our present moment in time. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments? Uh, well, I think that's what the passages are trying to reconcile, that there was a firm tradition of Jesus as a healer and as a miracle worker, um, and perhaps following along uh, similar traditions that we find both in Jewish and pagan traditions from a, from a similar uh, period. Um, uh, so, but I think that both Matthew and John emphasize that the point of those stories is not to demonstrate Jesus' amazing powers. I mean, John is very explicit about this with, the, with regard to all of the miracles. That it's not for the sake of drawing attention to himself as somebody that can do spectacular things. It's for drawing attention to his relationship with God. Um, and that's what you're supposed to learn from the miracles. So um, I think that uh, I don't really know, you know why it is that those stories or the traditions of miracle working had to be connected uh, at least in these cases, to the Sabbath. Um, uh, but I think that in both cases, it reflects a later tradition, not from the time of Jesus, that uh, did um, already question um, whether Christians would be obey, you know, keeping, the, keeping Shabbat in the same way that Jews do. So I think it's more uh, that those passages are more a reflection of Christian tradition rather than what actually happened, in the, right, reflecting what happened in the time of Jesus. Um, so those stories, the healing stories are brought in in order to uh, reflect on the role of Sabbath observance, I, I think. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the problem. We don't really know. And I, I tried to make that uh, point at the beginning. Uh, the Gospels are all we have. Now, in what I would say is that the default position is that Jesus was more or less observant in the same way as other Galilean Jews were, whatever that meant in, in the beginning of the first century. Uh, and that some of the references that we have to Jesus doing Jewish things are incidental references. Uh, and in that sense, perhaps reliable, maybe not with the specific to that event, uh, but reliable in the overall sense that Jesus was basically an observant Jew. So I would say that. Uh, as far as historical Jesus research is concerned, you know, there are the minimalists and there are the maximalists and a bunch of people in between. And uh, I'm on the extreme end of the minimalist uh, camp. I think Jesus was a historical person. I think he was born. I think he was born Jewish. I think he was baptized, did stuff, and then was crucified. That's about it. He, about the stuff that he did, I don't know what he really did, gathered followers, uh, otherwise we wouldn't have Christianity. So that, to me, that's the historical Jesus, that's about as far as we can really go. And that's why I want to emphasize that we're looking at how the gospel writers construct Jesus later on and read their own tensions back into the, into the life story of Jesus. There was a question here, yeah. So I, I think the, the idea that Jesus was an Arian in those blatant terms is something that, to my knowledge, and I'm not an expert in modern Christian theology, but to my knowledge, that was really limited to the Nazi period. But uh, what's, what's been interesting to me, um, when, I, when I read Susanna Heschel's book, actually, what really struck me was um, that it was, in a Nazi context, 
that there was a, that actually began modern historical scholarship on ethnicity in the Galilee. And there are still, there are many scholars now who uh, ponder this question about how many Gentiles were there in the Galilee, how many Jews. Um, we think of uh, Sean, Frain, uh, Sean Frain's work on the Jewish Galilee and others who want to argue, well, no, for a strong, uh, uh, for a strong Gentile presence. So what was kind of creepy to me was the fact that this modern discussion of this actually began in the Nazi period, but most people don't realize that until, until they read that uh, particular book. So I'd say that, in, that among you know, the general population, at least in terms of what I've encountered, um, there isn't really, or there never was really, that I can see a strong <coughs> view that Jesus was an Aryan in that sense. But there are people who are still surprised to learn that Jesus was Jewish. And I think that that surprise comes from, uh, well, perhaps it comes from certain Christian circles as well, but I think it comes primarily from our contemporary experience where we see a very sharp divide between Jews and Christians, where there's a synagogue and there's the church and we understand uh, you know, light, dark, good, bad, you know, various things, oppositions is synagogue, church. Even if we believe in coexistence, we see them as very separate and as believing very separate things. So I think people extrapolate back and say, well, you know, if this church and the synagogue are so separate, and given Jesus' role within the church, obviously Jesus couldn't have been Jewish. Um, I think that that position is waning as more and more people um, encounter some of the scholarship about Jesus, but also become more comfortable with the very idea that Jesus was Jewish and, um, and what that might mean for Christianity. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so those two titles sound like they should be opposite, right? If he's the son of God, how can he be the son of man? And in some uh, New Testament material, I think uh, particular of the Gospel of John, there's a contrast drawn uh, between those who are born of, you know, human be of, of men, let's say, and those who are born of God, uh, children born of the flesh and children born of the spirit. But uh, that contrast can't really be applied to those two titles for Jesus. Uh, because if those two titles come from different spheres and they mean somewhat different uh, but overlapping things. So the term son of man in Hebrew and in Aramaic in a kind of a common everyday sense simply means a human being. It's still used today in modern Hebrew uh, the way that we would say, you know, uh, some such person, or John Doe, or something. You, you, you use the word um, uh, Ben Adam, you know, son of man. Uh, but in uh, the book of uh, Daniel, and in some of the apocalyptic literature that was written sort of between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, the term son of man takes on a cosmic significance, perhaps referring to a cosmic savior who's, who's uh, kind of larger than life, you know, is up there with God in the clouds, coming with power from heaven and so on. And so in the New Testament, it's that apocalyptic title that is taken over for Jesus. Now for Son of God, that's a bit more complicated. Some people have suggested that it comes perhaps from a Gentile, you know, pagan, Greco-Roman influence, where they were accustomed, for example, to the idea that the emperor was somehow a son of the gods or uh, the idea that a, that a human being could be half God, half a uh, human being. And I think that there's something to that, that perhaps it comes from that. But it became a way in which, um, in which uh, Christians could talk about or articulate a particularly um, close and exclusive relationship between God and Jesus. Any other questions? Thank okay, thank you very much.